Welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Today I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me we have... Joe? Josh? Yeah, sadly Christian got called out for a work thing, so our first remote guest is Josh. If you had listened to our, I think our third episode, we actually yep. had Josh um, on the whole initial makerspace move episode but yeah. this episode's extra special because it's we pretty much have our entire makerspace moved this weekend it's so, huge um, yeah so i'm glad that we're at this point not two weeks ago yeah 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 so we'll probably dive more into that later um for sure because uh this week's topic is you know uh, the work life and maker balance how do we how do we as makerspace directors schedule our time and balance having a full-time job, um, being part of a family, but also running a makerspace and even then, you know, um, managing our own side projects. But before that, we have to talk about what we're drinking tonight. Um, I myself am still working on that Kirkland vodka. So I actually have some, uh, uh, this was this Coke zero cherry with some Kirkland vodka mixed. I'm already about halfway gone. <laughs> How does that not taste like cough syrup? <laughs> Which part, the vodka or the Coke Zero? <laughs> the mixture of the two. <laughs> Jokes on you. I love cough syrup. Well, that's where I was going. No, yeah, my wife hated the taste because there's way too much vodka in here. All right, uh, so I am drinking uh, some Boulevard unfiltered wheat, same as last week. I uh, I drank an insane amount of beer at IMTS, so. Uh, this is the first time I've drank since I got back from that and just finishing off the six pack. <laughs> I raided the fridge and I have like one offs of everything right now. So I am drinking a Sam Adams raspberry lemon. Is it Goss? I think. Is it G A U S S? Yeah. Uh, G O G O S E. Goes. Goes. Goze. Goze. Somebody's going to correct us on this. <laughs> yeah, this please. will be the first comment we get. Please somebody, do. Yeah, <laughs> it, we're just a bunch of morons. Yeah, <laughs> I have two of these, and I'm. It's the first one is going down so good. I may have to get the second one. Yeah, that's how it usually goes. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get started with the news. We have. A lot of really good, actually, news articles this week, so I'm really excited to go through them. Let's see. Let's see. On the 11th, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation released an article saying that they are they're acknowledging a flaw with their latest shipment of the Raspberry Pi Power Over Ethernet um, Pi Hats. Um, they're rated to get upwards of, like, 15 watts over the Ethernet port, um, but they're still seeing a lot of power instability on the Raspberry Pi itself. And uh, after some investigation, they found that um, even though that you can give it up to 15 watts of power, there's an issue with uh, the interaction between the fairly low frequency switching regulator on the hat and one of the two brands of USB um, current switches that are on the board. So apparently it came down to a testing error when they were doing their... Um, uh, product testing. They have two different brands of that switch on there, and the super heavy load testing was happened to be done with the one brand of um, switch, and the light load testing was done with a different brand. So it just barely managed to slip through the cracks. Um, but they recognize that it's an issue, and they are happily um, accepting returns for those if you have an affected product. Um, the community also came together really well which I'm always a big fan of. And they came up with a couple of really good DIY mods to fix it yourself if, if you're into that. Oh, nice. That's yeah. exciting. That's yeah, it. a lot of it requires some finely tuned uh, soldering and whatnot. But Well, you can quickly find out if you're good at that or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Sir, it, it, are they expensive hats? Uh, I actually haven't checked. I mean, last time I checked the aftermarket ones before Raspberry Pi had their own, um, they were kind of pricey. But and that's why I did the exter external one that, and you can actually buy them with the mini USB or sorry, micro USB and Ethernet 
uh, pigtails, and they work just as good. Oh, and, nice. And they're cheap. They're I like, think they're about $20 on Canna oh, Kit. Man, that's not bad. $20 might be a fun soldering experiment. Uh, see yeah. if you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, I would wait till they fix it. But it looks like a neat little unit. It's pretty low profile, and it even includes a, a powered fan yeah. to help cool everything. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of anything the, the Pi Foundation does. I, I try to buy their legit things to support them because their projects are awesome. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. I will say that I like the latest Pi. Very much. Very much so. Except for... Like- Six of them running through my house right now. Yeah. Six. There's one on each printer, one on each chameleon cage. Oh, gosh. Uh... <laughs> so you realize they run like at, like what, five watts each? One now? in my. You know what, Aaron? When you have as much <laughs> stuff going on as I do, you, you don't notice. You don't. I mean, at the a certain power... point, it becomes cheaper just to run a desktop and then just containerize all the things yeah mm. yeah you know it, it, that becomes back into the the time versus money equation and i know how to set up the pies quickly and easily that's true i don't know how to do containers that's I true i haven't got that far i get joe, it joe we need to introduce you to home assistant yeah oh yeah josh and i are working on that today slightly yeah i was not issues yeah that was my entire day today was home assistant all right, we've diverged. <laughs> next topic. All right, next uh, topic. Fusion 360 has changed their tiers again. Um, so Fusion 360 has always had kind of pricing tiers. Uh, they've had a free version for makers, hobbyists, students, and startups under $100,000 a year in revenue. And then they've had the basic version, which has ranged in price from $25 up to, I think it's currently $300. And then they've had the ultimate version, which I think in its first uh, was either five or $700 and is currently $1,500 a year. And they just announced that they are changing their tiering again uh, and going back to a single tier, which they did this two years ago. Um, and then they, they came, they went back to the basic and ultimate tier. Uh, but this time the, uh, combined tier is going to be $500 and, uh, that does not affect the free tier, but the $500 tier gets you everything that's an ultimate, um, at just a slightly more expensive per year cost than the basic. And, uh, um, I, for one, I'm actually kind of excited about this. I I know $500 a year for software for some people is like, ah, I oh no. But um, what this gets you for $500 is two very professional level things that uh, you're not going to get anywhere else. And that's five axis cam. Uh, so you're able to write code for a five axis CNC machine and uh, generative design. And I'm going to talk more about this in an interview I did with Curtis Chan at IMTS uh, that we'll release uh, later. Uh, we're working on figuring out how we're going to release those. But generative design essentially lets you input a CAD model and then define the um, some properties to it where you need strength and where you don't. And then the computer will go through and remove or add material as needed and create these really beautiful organic models that are also very light and very strong. Um, it's a really interesting thing that's been happening in industry for the last couple of years. So, uh, hmm. so if you're making money doing that, 500 is no big deal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, totally. And, you know, you can still make money with Fusion up to $100,000 a year in revenue. Right. So, yeah. So, if you're even if you're anywhere near close to that point, you know, 500 for a year is no big deal if you need, you know, five axis stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like our entire uh, startup company that I work for, we run off of Fusion. Yeah. You know, there's four of us and we all use Fusion because 
our company doesn't make a hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue yet. <laughs> there so you go. It's totally fine. Is a rotary axis considered fourth or fifth axis? Uh, rotary is a fourth. Um, so you can do fourth axis with the uh, basic package, but I'm not sure if you can do simultaneous fourth. So you can do um, a wrapped axis where it's just rolling it like the X or the Y axis. Yeah. But you can't do um, where it's tracking the the rotation with the with the tool. Um, uh okay. So like oblong objects or something like that. Um I don't think you can do with the basic. Um, Interesting. Just something that we've been fighting with uh for a recent personal project we're trying to find a way around now. But still like $500 a year is like what like $45 a month. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's not bad at all when you break it down like that. For no. professional level CAD, CAM and simulation software. Right? For a that's, for a dollar and thirty cents a day. Yeah. Be- well, before this, it was between uh, fifteen and thirty thousand dollars for a seat of similar level software. So <laughs> it's pretty big. I feel, I feel like anyway, we're like yeah. marketing like elderly oh. insurance for a cup for the price of a cup of coffee a day. Yeah, you could have fusion. But like I said, I'm going to dive more into this in the interview with Curtis Chan. And it was a really good interview. Um, and uh, yeah. So what else is in Maker News, Aaron? Uh, uh, on Hackaday, this guy uh, announced a really awesome project called the Verk One. It is a, it's going to be an open source scare robot arm. And it is just gorgeous. Uh, it is a combination of some fancy plywood. It it's is a, Australian Blackwood. Yeah. It's the most beautiful robot arm I've ever seen. <laughs> I know. I'm so much in love with it. Um, I know I've been talking to Joe a while back that I really want to do some robot arm projects because I feel like uh, general purpose robot arms are going to be huge down the road. So I want to learn how to program them and whatnot. Yeah. So, but I was thinking about making my own design, but this just looks so nice. And why, why design my own when someone did a great job already? Um, so... Uh, we'll post a link in the show notes for this, but I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to it because it's just a really cool looking project. It seems to look really nice and, and works really nice. Um, he's planning on doing a, a small scale batch uh, crowd st- uh, Kickstarter for it. And then if the Kickstarter is successful enough, he'll open source the design. So currently it's just a teaser essentially. Mm-hmm. But um, if it's if there's enough interest, essentially he will open source the whole design. Then I'll probably make one. Yep. I'll probably do the wood, too, because that just looks awesome. Let's see. Besides that, uh, oh, do you want to add something to that? Nope. Okay. The next one also came from Hackaday. Um, I feel like it's a very appropriate source for our Maker News. Uh, Someone came up with a really awesome design for a DIY pneumatic actuator, or like a linear actuator. Um. These are usually more industrial type devices that are really expensive, but he managed to make a really awesome design out of just plywood and PVC pipe and some basic uh, threaded rod. Um, there's a there's a YouTube video in the actual article, and it seems he he uh, demonstrates how powerful it can be. And I just loved how simple the design was and how cheap it could be made. That this showed up in my Google feed this week. It, it was that was a like. It kind of made me think of what could I use that for in my day to day projects. <laughs> he even used it as a he used it as a foot powered clamp just for doing Craig screws, like pocket holes. Like that's just super simple, but he even had it pressurized and he was able to lift like a whole board with it if you watch the video. Yeah. Very um I I'm really interested in doing uh some DIY pneumatic actuator science. And determining the breaking point for the size and then coming up with the uh, the equation for how much pressure for the size of the uh, PVC pipe and whatnot. Because this could be super easy and interesting. to, to His whole point with this was um, when he's building projects, he can now make a dynamically sizable actuator for and build it right into his project um, when an industrial... App, um, sourceable item may not be available whereas now 
if he needs more pressure, he can just make a bigger actuator and just throw it right into his model easily. I thought that was really cool. It's very interesting. I've never even thought about trying to do something like that. So <laughs> It looks super dangerous <laughs> just because it's literally just a piece of pipe, PVC pipe, uh, sandwiched between two pieces of plywood held together by four ro- uh, threaded rods and some bolts. Hey. So it looks like a little bomb, but... If it can't kill you, it's not fun, right? <laughs> and if it doesn't kill you, it just makes you stronger. Something like that. <laughs> we are in no way advocating that you build this thing at your home. Yes. Let's just make that clear. All right, and then the last thing, uh, which is sort of makes uh, a segue into our topic, uh, but is really interesting nonetheless, is uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, in the latest kernel release has changed the code of conduct from a code of conflict. Who is Linus? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice with your interjecting. Yeah. Uh, Linus Torvalds is the creator of the Linux kernel. Um, Yay. That, that we all know and love. And the, the Linux-, Linux kernel? The Linux kernel. The Linux kernel. I feel like you're interjecting something that I don't know. Sorry. No, no, no. no I'm just being obnoxious. Yeah, no, the Linux kernel. So the underlying software for the uh, Linux desktop operating system, but, you know, also the underlying software for what half the Internet runs on. And uh, some would argue over half the Internet. It's yeah. like se- it's over 70 percent. It's uh, it's what's bringing this podcast to your ears as you're listening. Um, so before they ran under sort of a code of conflict um, and uh, they have changed to the code of conduct to uh, instigate a more um, accepting uh, work environment, would you say? Say more, yeah. more open to outside opinions. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. For those of you who don't know, um, Linus is very heavy handed in his responses to some pull requests for um, new code to the Linux kernel. He has been known to curse and be very mean in his emails, you know, in his replies to new code suggestions or new applications. Um, It's become sort of a meme or an inside joke to the Linux community because in the end he means well, and he's kind of the, the benevolent dictator for the entire project. Um, being, and being the creator himself, you know, he kind of does have a say, the, the final say in how everything is, uh, applied. But, um, in this announcement, he's kind of admitting that, yeah, I've been kind of unprofessional at times and enough people have told me that I am not great with people and I want to work on that. I still want to, he still wants to maintain the kernel, but he just wants to be better at the people side of it. So, uh, what? keep going, keep going, Joe. Which, I mean, I'm going to say just from a development perspective, I get it. I'm there. I've been there. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, I read his articles and I'm like, yeah, you know, makes valid points and he cursed along the way and that's it. But not everybody takes it that way. Because not everybody's in that industry. Yeah. Well, we've worked with plenty of people that were difficult to work with in that sense. And it's nice that he's been able to say, hey, maybe I made a mistake in some places, so I'm going to go work on this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's great. I do, too. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the maker community in general, and I mean... I would say that people skills are not in the probably the top five or the top ten of skills of probably a good chunk of makers. What? No, not at all. <laughs> what? <laughs> you mean and, people who devote their careers to some arcane C level programming language aren't aren't the most you know sociable people? I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know this this really ties into our topic for the night right it's just like it does uh balancing everything we do 
and how that affects uh, you know our personal relationships and uh, how we handle our coworkers and our co makers and in all of that. I think it's an important topic, and it's one that I know Josh and I get asked constantly: is how how do you do so much and stay married and keep your job and uh, keep up making stuff? So, it, yeah, Aaron, actually, you asked me that this week because I did. Yeah, <laughs> your your wife was like, "How does your wife deal with it?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because my wife, my wife barely has been tolerating me the past week with all the makerspace move and and stuff. Well, I think that's the first step is finding a wife that can tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think my wife knew what she was in for when she met me. Maybe not when she met you, but she should have known when she married you. Oh, yeah. It takes about a week and a half to understand Josh. Yeah. (laughs) I I think it was when you and I went and bought the lathe and mill that she really, truly understood. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That was a good day. That was a good day. day. So, Josh, how do you manage it? So, I mean, everybody like everybody that has asked me this, I'd say a majority of my responses are, I still don't understand it myself. So, I'm just going to wing it and say that it is, I sleep very little. And any time that I have open and available that I can escape, I escape. Yeah. to do things. And I mean, that is everything from, and I'm not escaping personal, but like even work, like I've got, I'm it as a day job. So, and programming and I can do that from anywhere. So, you know, I may spend a day at the makerspace. I may and work while I'm there. So I don't have to travel extra and I can make better use of my time. You know, we're on a late night chat and everybody's sleeping and I'm still awake. Yeah. That's a very valid point. We purposely record this stuff after 10 p.m. when all the rest of the family goes to sleep. Yeah. I think that's the key is is good use of our time. Now, I I think all three of us used to play a ton of video games. I know I don't anymore. Nope. Um. You know, it, it's I, uh, all, all the time that's available to us is it used in a manner that pushes our goals forward. It, yep. It's a, is a good way of saying it. But like, Josh, you and I have known each other forever. And yeah. I don't think at any point in our relationship, either one of us has been different than we are now. And we're, no. we've always been driven towards some goal um, with the same amount of drive and passion. Um, it's just we before we had a little more free time so we could fit video games in. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, and now what we do for video games is we create we we hold land parties so we can play our video games. And then it's yeah. a it's oh we got to makerspace is having a land party so we got to go <laughs> and help support it. Yeah. <laughs> Good, yeah, totally. good, good point. There is new space equals and fast internet equals land party, which I can't wait. Yes, so excited. But yeah, how do you manage it, Aaron? I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> uh, I think that's yeah. the right answer. Like, yeah. Uh, what I've been doing is, uh, you know, it's not it's not that hard for me. I don't think. The problem is I have to manage my wife's uh, stress levels. Uh, so for those of you who have been listening, we have a five and a half month old now, our first. And a lot of whenever we're not together, it's her taking care of the baby. So what I've been trying to do is, uh, you know, make sure I'm being extra communicative with her, asking her, you know, what does she need me to do, you know, today or this week? Um what are your plans, stuff like that, kind of work it out with her saying, you know, especially with this makerspace move, I knew I was going to be super busy this month. So I told her, like, I know I'm going to be really busy 
I don't want you to get overwhelmed. You know, what can I do to make your life easier? And it becomes a bit of an extra burden on me to then plan out the extra activities that need to be done, like, you know, help out around the house, do stuff like that, take care of additional extra things for her so that she can then just focus on the baby. It, it's a little bit more more work to then schedule and plan all that out. But once I get that done, then she's okay with me spending, you know, two or three days straight moving equipment between buildings and helping, you know, flesh out the new space. Um, that's just for the makerspace move. But for my side projects, um, I haven't really done much since the baby came. Uh, a lot of it's, if she's not holding the baby, I'm holding the baby. So it, it hasn't been a whole lot of uh, work that done there yet. Um, I'm pl- So at least for this podcast, uh, we've been doing stuff generally after 10 p.m., I've been considering starting to try and do more stuff once the baby goes to sleep because Jane, uh, my wife also goes to sleep at the same time. So I've been trying, I've been considering maybe doing more work after they go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But um, my wife also has this thing where she would, she prefers that I go to sleep with her at the same time, which is kind of an, I feel like that's kind of an odd thing. Because, like, why does it really matter? Because we're both asleep. Because um, I could also just go to sleep with her and then wake up and then come downstairs and do stuff. I've done that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it, yeah, it's very much a, a person-by-person thing. Um, you know, I, 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 I generally believe that you really need to be extra, you know, be extra communicated with your spouse or your partner and figure out what they, what they need what they expect of you and what they need from you before you actually do your own things. Cause technically my side projects and my fun things are extraneous to being the family person to providing that care and that need. Um, I need to satisfy all of those needs first before I can do the things that aren't necessarily required, which is all the makerspace stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that, if, that, yeah, that's how, that's how I do it so far. I think a big thing is, um, managing your abilities so like understanding how much sleep you could potentially go without without affecting your your day job or your your family life uh, i know i turn into a real jerk when i haven't had enough sleep so uh me staying up for two nights to finish something up could be potentially uh you know destructive to my abilities to be a dad uh, and and you're recognizing that stuff, paying, paying close attention. But also, um, I think it's really important uh, as you are trying to figure out how to balance your time is um, paying attention to when you're the most productive, or um, you know, looking at like, well, you know, if I do these things, these specific tasks at this time of day, I can get this much done. Or if I tried to do them after midnight, I only get like one or two things done. So maybe it's better to go to go to sleep and get that sleep and then use that extra energy the next day. You know, I, I, uh, I can tell pretty quick how productive I'm going to be after I put the kids to bed on if I sit down and initially start scrolling through my smartphone or if I can, you know, sit down on my laptop and, um, you know, like start knocking out a CAD design or editing the podcast or something like that. Um, I, I really quickly can tell if I, if my night is going to be productive or not. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that I actually, when you guys ping me to do this, I was like, oh, do I really want to do this or do I want to just kind of like go to bed? <laughs> And the go to bed really kind of weighed heavily on my mind, especially after like three straight weekends of doing makerspace stuff. Yeah. And not just like makerspace stuff, like minor stuff, like scrubbing walls, ripping things down, painting walls. I mean, oh my gosh, we were moving stuff, taking things down, loading it into trucks. Oh my gosh. Never again do I want to move that mill and that lathe, but when we move oh, it gosh. again. That was so bad. Well, oh. Maybe we'll sell them when we move again. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, like, to that point, sometimes I just need to, like, start doing stuff again. 
and I can kind of power through that moment of being tired and then I'm productive again. But I have to be really careful with that because sometimes that productive energy doesn't end until 4 a.m. And then I'm just <laughs> destroyed for the next day. <laughs> so I've been actually curious. Uh, I know I've made a couple mentions of it at the, at the space, but I've been really interested in some biohacking. Um, just some light stuff like the magnetic finger implant and whatnot. <laughs> But <laughs> just the light one, light stuff. Yeah, j- just a slight implant. <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the thing, one of the the interesting things about the human body is that you know that we need sleep, and that's all, we spend what a third of our t- our entire life sleeping, right? And so I'm curious as to what we can do to reduce the amount of sleep that we need. So, and I'm I'm curious if that'd be an interesting. If there's any sort of uh, biohack research on reducing sleep or, you know, using something like Adderall to be more productive and who knows. So So. there's a a ton of research. And one of our old members uh, did a lot of uh, experimenting with it. And it actually got to the point where when his fiance found out why he was being so weird, she almost left him over it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um because he he had figured out little hacks to do like three and four days with no sleep uh but towards oh, wow. the end of the third or fourth day it, it was starting to get rough um and pretty much if you read the research uh like things like micro naps are the most effective and it's just mm. like scheduling out your sleep and sparsing it out throughout the day instead of taking it all in one chunk. But anything that effectively decreases the sleep is significantly, um, significantly decreases your performance and your energy. Um, Interesting. So it's like, uh, it's about the minimum amount of sleep that you can do and still be an effective human is about five hours. And after a while, that starts to build up. And then you have to like, you have to gain it back. Get a sleep debt. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, so I can, you're saying the the what he found was if we get the same amount of sleep but dispersed, yeah, into different tiny chunks. Yeah, there's actually quite a bit of research on that. I haven't really started, but it's something I've been interested in looking into because I really want to. I have lots of things I want to do, but I feel like I don't have enough time to do it. And yep. I feel like I and I feel like I have to sleep a lot in general. So yeah. I feel I've been curious to see what I could do to improve my energy levels and reduce the amount of time I need to sleep. The problem with it is, especially as Westerners, is our jobs will not allow what needs to happen. It, right, you have to sleep like forty-five minutes to an hour every two to three hours. So. And most of our jobs just wouldn't, it just, you couldn't do it. Right. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, that's, I, I mean, I can tell you this, even the micro naps only last so long. I mean, I do. Is that why they're micro? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Zing>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On, when I do the running event every year, um, we i we do two nights where we don't sleep and every for uh, every 45 minutes you're having to get up get out and greet in runners and you get like half hour 45 minutes of sleep and there you there comes a point in the night where you just your body just wants to just give up and be like i'm just going to ignore ev- all the outside influences and then just shut down and let you sleep yeah. and it's like you f- you have to fight it so it's like not even like your micro nap is something that you can get into a deep sleep you literally are like fighting your body and your brain from totally shutting down yep yeah, it's all about finding the right spots spots in your REM cycles. And if you have messed up sleep at all, like I, I, I'm a hypersomniac and have all kinds of weird sleep issues. Uh, you just can't. So it's it's weird. 
I didn't realize you knew this much about sleep, Joe. <laughs> well, I didn't like, expect I didn't expect this much discourse out of it. Yeah. <laughs> segues are hard um <laughs> how do you guys prioritize projects so like, like me i always have at least six projects going <laughs> and when one of them starts to finish up i'm like i should add two more and never <laughs> finish that one yeah. um so how do you guys prioritize and like decide like tonight i'm gonna make stuff or like man eh, maybe 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 tonight i actually am gonna play titanfall instead of making how do, you, how do you guys do that? I think it all depends on my, like, where I'm at with different things and what has been going on from outside influences. And I think that's also changed. Like, Joe, like, you and I have been, you've been at the makerspace the longest. I'm second longest here, and you're the third. But I've noticed even, like, getting involved in the makerspace how I prioritize things has changed. And even from when I, I'd say the first year and a half with the makerspace to how I prioritize things now is even different because with the, especially when you add the makerspace into it and especially when you're, you're helping run things and stuff like that, you don't want to totally like, like drop the ball down. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, I've even got, I think all of us as officers have gone through stents where we've like let everybody down. Um, just cause you get burned out that, you know, outside influences, family, you know, all that stuff. Like I went dark this year, the beginning of the year, because me and my wife were trying to figure out where we're going to move next and we're on a hard timeline. And so it's like, well, I got to do planning for that. Cause that's, you know, I got to live somewhere and my family has to live somewhere. But then it's like, I come back to the makerspace and I go, and it's just like Aaron, you said earlier, you know, I told my wife, all right, when September comes, I'm going to be makerspace and the new, and the facility because I have facility responsibilities out, even outside of the makerspace. And I gave her a huge heads up and kind of like hoping that I at least broke even with the I've dropped the ball earlier in the year with my officer's duties. I've hopefully have made up for it with all the work that we've done with the move. So now nah, uh, we're going to need about two more weeks out of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, and then like coming back to like the personal stuff, like I've, I've started to get better at prioritizing my personal projects in things as well, because there for a while, especially at the makerspace, it was like, I felt like every time I walked through the door, somebody was there waiting on the other side to just have me help them with their project. Yeah. And I was n- never yeah. able to do my own stuff. It's rough. Yep. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. we there. Right. Yeah, I mean that was as, as as frustrating as that can be. You know that was our original intent of starting the makerspace was helping people create and sharing our abilities and love for creating. Right? Yeah. We are part of the, we are part of the value of the makerspace. We're yeah. not just a tool shop. We are a knowledge base. Yeah, but well, we have to remember that. Hey. Yep. Every time I walk in and I'm like, ah, yeah, <laughs> I really don't want to help with the laser, but all right. Yeah. I'm going to help with the laser. Cause that's, that's really why I'm here. I have a laser at home. If I want to use a laser, like that's why I'm coming to the space is to, to contribute and, and to share and to be a useful part of that community. Well, yeah. And I mean, well, I mean, you look at all the tools in the makerspace, you have a good chunk of tools that the makerspace has. I have a good chunk of tools. Aaron, I can't speak for you. But I, I have some tools. Yeah. But just because, you know, there's some tools that I just use the makerspace for. But, like, I was using the makerspace very heavily for welding, and now I have a welder because I didn't want to travel to have to do all my welding all the time, and I was doing enough of it to make it worth my while. Yeah. But, 
yeah, it's not just the tools. I mean, I come yeah. f- for the friendships, the camaraderie, the helping others. That's a whole yeah. other episode, Josh. I know. <laughs> that is a whole other episode. <laughs> I'm starting to get emotional here, guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I, that, that's, that is a very common theme, though. Every time we start talking about the makerspace, like, we, we end up going back to that. So we need to talk about that in the next couple of weeks. Is like, why the makerspace and why not a, a personal workshop? That, that needs to come up, Aaron. Or why both? Yeah, or why both? Yeah, totally. Because yeah. I'm a big fan of both. Yep. Uh, like, for me, back on the the thing I was pushing, for me, when I'm trying to prioritize my projects, it's it's you know, what am I feeling right now? What what am I passionate about tonight? Or what have I been dying to work on today? Um, and if I haven't felt like that about anything, um, my next steps I go through are, is somebody else counting on me to finish this project? You know, it's is there money on the line? It's never necessarily about like, oh, I need to make this money. It's always about like somebody else's business, depending on this thing that I'm trying to finish up. <laughs> and if that's the case, I'll usually push through whatever drudgery I've been dealing with. And if that's not the case, um, you know, a lot of times I'll just take the night off and, and go do something different. But, um, you know, if I, and this is how I've kind of handled all of the arts and things that I've done throughout the years is if I am not feeling it, I'm not going to push it because it won't be done up to the level of quality that I expect out of myself or, um, you know, the level of, uh, of finish or creativity that I, I try to achieve when I'm creating things. So, um, yeah, that that's a, a big thing for me is uh, whether or not it's something that's interesting to me at that specific time. And that has a big deal about whether or not I'll take on a project anymore. Um, yeah, even if somebody is offering me a pile of money to work on a project for them or, um, you know, something that I might want to sell at some point, if I'm not interested in it, I have zero interest in working on it. So, and I, I've actually, you say that. And I, in the last year I've like come to terms with saying no. Yeah. To those type of projects. I've said no to far more than I've said yes to this year. Yeah. Uh, And it feels, it feels good to be selective on the things that I'm willing to commit my time to because like we've talked about tonight, there's so little of it. I, I mm-hmm. want to be very picky on what gets it. Yeah. yeah. So for me, um, it's definitely a combination of interest and maybe some uh, money related. Some of it more necessity. So the products that I have lined up are the the K40 laser Z table, which is very close to being done design wise. Um, that's just important because uh, that laser at the makers, it's, it's a laser that we have at the makerspace and it's been inactive now for two months. Yeah. The existing table we've had that long. I, I think so. Oh God. Poor, those poor members. <laughs> but so it's an automated Z axis table for the laser cutter, the, the tiny Z, the tiny Chinese uh, laser cutter we have at the space. And all it does is it will take the material that you put in it and it will automatically focus the, the material to the focal length of the lens of the laser. And that's really handy. Um, but the one we had broke and we tried to fix it. It didn't work. So, um, and there, there was a commercially available option that we could have bought, but it was out of stock. So it was up to, well, we could, I don't know, just try and manually adjust the height and maybe get it close or just mark the laser as inoperable until we get a new table. Um, there was one thing we could have bought that, that Holgamod's one, yeah. but it kind of looked like crap and it was 200 bucks or, or something. It yeah. was expensive for what it was. It was just... 
angle iron and 3D printed joints. And we're like, Psh, that's like 20 bucks in parts. We can make our own. Mostly that was me. Hundreds of I dollars. I said, we can make our own. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got some beefy, I got a really beefy, uh, robust uh, design that I'm really excited for. And uh, I made a whole Slack channel for it. And we got a lot of, I got a lot of input and I got a really good design for it. But so that's more out of the the need um, mm-hmm. as far as priority. The makerspace needs their machines to work. I want I wanted to make a really nice design that will be robust and will just work. Um, and I feel like I have that. It's like 90% done. That's mostly done um, in the evenings when uh, my wife has the baby and I have all my chores done. So I can, you know, have a little bit of free, a bit of free time. So that's done. I have the K40Z table. I have the Makerspace Access Control System, which I made really good progress on up until uh, the the day we had the baby, and it has I haven't been touched it since. Um, I I that is also kind of high on my priority just because I feel like the Makerspace really needs it. Um. um I, our rates are, are somewhat low um, in makerspace due rates. Um, and I feel like this is one of the reasons why we have it so low is we wanted people to, we wanted a low barrier to entry for people to come into the space and check it out. And um, with that low barrier to entry though is, is low, uh, low rates, but then you would then supplement that with um, rates by rates per mach- per machine. So based on whichever machines you use, you would just pay a, a variable rate from that. Right. But we can't really monitor that. Is right now it's on an honor system, which you know arguably may or may not work. Um, I have a really awesome system planned out. Um, I've been utilizing a lot of the other people in the makerspace who are also software developers, um, getting other people's perspectives on how the how everything should be organized. I, had, I almost had a prototype done. But then we had the baby, and so development pretty much halted. I tried to get, I tried to pay somebody at the space to try and take over it, or at least do the legwork for me while I do the the the, the thinking. But he he wasn't a huge fan of the idea. And but, that goes right back to money isn't a very good motivator a lot of times. It's interest, <laughs> at least in our um, space. Yeah, for sure. Like I was willing to pay like. A decent amount of money, like way over minimum wage, because I know this is specialized labor. Like I just want it done, and I'm willing to pay for it. I just need somebody to do the legwork while I do the mind work, because I don't have the time to do the legwork right now. Right. Um, so I have the, the 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 laser table, the access control system. Recently, I took I uh, took on a project with our local museum. They wanted to 3D scan some of the artifacts they have on display so that people who come through can actually handle 3D printed versions of those artifacts and museum objects. They can kind of get a feel for it. Um, But they looked at commercially available options for scanning equipment, and it gets really quickly expensive for good reason. It's, It's a lot of work. Especially if you want it fully automated, it's a lot of work, which require, which means a lot of expense. Yeah, um, I've been personally interested in it um, to do. It's called photogrammetry, where you take a lot of high qual, high resolution pictures in a three sixty degree view of the object. Um, I there's some uh, designs out there to do a fully like you know progr- programmatic scan of the object using that. So I wanted to build that whole thing for it just for my personal use and the makerspace use. But then they got a hold of me and I want to work with that. But with the makerspace move, that also became a lower, lower priority because they don't really have a really huge need for it right now. And I told them that I'm interested, but I got to move this makerspace as a director. So that's a higher priority. Um, I'll come or I'll circle back with you after a month or two when we get settled so that's a little bit lower priority. Yeah, we need to remember yeah. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's a really awesome sounding project, and I have a really 
pretty decent design already that I've talked with you about. Yeah. But so that's kind of like my third priority. Um, that, that might change after the move is done and settled. Um, I really want to do the access control system, but this may, so this is actually the scanning thing could be a revenue thing for me personally, cause I'm trying to do more maker for hire projects right. and having, having a legit, um, open source 3d scanning system that nobody else really has could be a thing for me. Yeah. So I'm thinking about doing that, but I also have the tiny mill or the tiny CNC router router from the space. And I want to convert that to Gerbil. And uh, I just haven't had the time. I haven't had the time to sit down and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to do that. And very bottom, very bottom is my entire workshop cleaning, organizing it. That's always the least. So, but it should be one of the highest. You know, part <laughs> part of, uh, it, and I'm the same way. But you know, part of being a productive maker is having a a reasonably organized system for dealing with your tools and making sure that you're not spending that valuable making time looking for that Allen wrench. Yeah, it's a, uh, it, that was uh, one of the talks we went to at IMTS was uh, a guy talking about lean manufacturing. And I went to school for lean manufacturing at the same time that I was implementing lean manufacturing in my big yellow tractor job. And everything about lean makes me want to vomit and uh, punch whoever is talking about it in the in the throat except for this guy because his implementations of it made sense and uh, were about um, making your job work better and smarter and uh, making the shop flow better and not about making metrics Mm -hmm. Um, i i appreciate tangible changes in workflow um, I do not appreciate checks on a spreadsheet and bars graphs to make other people happy that don't understand what my job is. So, but how, how do you feel about Six Sigma? <laughs> uh, well, probably about this. <laughs> I think I just described it. Yeah, yeah. It, it has so, its place when you are using it right and you're making. Like I said, tangible changes to workflow. But when you're just improving things to improve things uh, or improving things to make someone else happy that doesn't understand why the improvements are being made, then it's wasted effort, which is the exact same thing that Six Sigma is against. It's wasted effort and movement. It drives me insane. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. So we're... So I'm going to turn back the clock a little bit to what we talked about. And we keep bringing up family and family and, you know, like Aaron, you keep bringing up your kid, your, your baby. It's good to know. She's pretty great. Yeah. There's on, of the three people on this chat, there's six kids between Mm -hmm. all three of us and two of us have twins. Yeah. So kids aren't an excuse. Yeah. (laughs) Every time somebody comes to the makerspace, they're like, I'd love to come here, but I have kids. I'm like, yes, so do I. Yeah. What now? <laughs> and then, but it, then occasionally they're like, but I have seven. And I'm like, you're busy. Yeah. But- <laughs> 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 well, and I, that's one thing with the whole progression over time and, you know, like getting older and all that stuff. But kids kids change a lot of the maker life too that I've noticed. I mean, mine are three now twin three-year-old boys and I can't like, they're starting to get to the point where I can get them, bring them into things, which I can't wait till they get like, yeah, they can actually hang out with me in my shop. But it's even interesting too, like the planning of my shop, my, like the things that I do. And then even like trying to balance the, time with them like i haven't spent all this time in the last three weeks with my wife and kids and like today my wife she had a thing with work and she had to work 12 hours and so i just i was home with the boys so like before lunch i'm like ah boys let's go outside and play and i threw everything down and you know some that is one thing that i've noticed is that sometimes you just got to put your maker life away and just kind of enjoy some things because you can miss things as much as you're enjoying things with your maker life. 
you can miss things so quickly yeah. getting to overdoing it with your with certain things there's always you can have too much of something yep exactly that's a good uh point to wrap up on yeah which is I, I you know agree. everything in moderation family comes first yeah um yeah. yeah. So we're coming up on the 56 mi- 57 minute mark, probably our longest episode yet. But but very good discussion. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so very good discussion. Uh this is one of my more favorite episodes just cuz we've had such a good discussion. I hope you all have enjoyed it. Um feel free to check us out on Facebook. We're on most of the social media groups. We have a subreddit. Um we want to hear back from you. We definitely want to grow that community around around our podcast, but just the make community in general. Yep. We want to hear back from you. We want to know what you like to, to hear, what you don't like to hear. Let us know if you want you... to hear Josh again. Yeah. Josh was all right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the audio engineer behind this. That's what I want to be. <laughs> yeah. So definitely let us know. Um, we really want your feedback. We want we want to tailor this to what you want to hear. So definitely let us know. Yep. And Um, be on the lookout in the coming weeks for all the IMTS interviews. And, um, if you're a maker or you're influential in the maker community and you want to be interviewed, let us know. Those were super duper fun. I want to do a lot more of them. Yeah. I mean, figure out how to integrate those into the show. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. This is Keep Joe. making yeah, stuff. Thank you. And this is Aaron. This is Josh. <laughs> See ya. Yep. See ya.